Hi, I'm Jules van Binsberg and a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to do something a little different. Neither Jules nor I are experts in digital currencies. And both of us are confused by the news and the hype around central bank digital currencies. So what we decided to do in this episode is ask a world expert, one of my colleagues at Stanford, Kevin Walsh, to come and talk about it and see if we can jointly learn something about central bank digital currencies. Before we turn to Kevin, let's just quickly go over what a currency is. Well, so the first question related to that is, why can a piece of paper that has no intrinsic value have any use or any value in transactions? Why, Jonathan, are you letting me pay you with a piece of paper that has no intrinsic value? And I think that the answer is not too difficult. Suppose that I wanted to buy your house and I was going to pay you with an amount of gold of the equivalent value. Now, given the fact that I don't want to be carrying this gold around, I just have the gold stored at the bank. And the bank has given me a piece of paper that says the owner of this piece of paper can anytime come and claim this amount of gold. Now, given the fact that you have no intention of carrying the gold around either, and you just want to have possession of the gold, all I have to do is give you the piece of paper that says that you can go and claim the gold. And so we can pay each other with an intrinsically worthless piece of paper as long as that piece of paper represents a claim to something else, the gold that is stored in the bank, and I can buy your house with that piece of paper from you. So Jules, that's a good example, and it it works for the gold standard, but we're no longer on the gold standard. So how does it work in modern economies? Well, so as it turns out, what gives a piece of paper value, and the dollar in particular, is that... Through taxes, the U.S. government has a claim on all of the production that we jointly make, because all of us need to pay a fraction of what we produce as taxes to the government. And because you're allowed to pay your taxes with these pieces of paper, and because the taxes are a claim on underlying goods, and because the piece of paper allows you to pay the taxes, which in terms are a claim on the underlying goods, we still have something real that backs the dollar. And that is the fact that you can pay your taxes with it. And so what backing the dollar is essentially the production of the United States. But part of that is a promise by the government not to issue more dollars and change the ratio of how many dollars there are to consumption. And so I would say that one of the reasons the dollar is a reserve currency is people have a lot of trust that the government of the United States won't inflate the money supply and devalue the currency. Indeed. I think that the main thing that we'll have to talk today about also with Kevin is the value of this trust, where this trust comes from, and whether or not that trust currently is under threat. Because what we're hearing all the time now today is, and that is the topic of today's episode, is that we somehow need to go digital, and that for some reason digital dollars are different than real dollars. I don't really understand it because the U.S. dollar is essentially already a digital currency. Very little of U.S. dollars is in backnotes. Almost all U.S. dollars are in electronic form. So in what sense would the dollar need to be digital? It's already digital. No, that is true because indeed a very small fraction is only currently held in cash. But I think that what people generally talk about is that for some reason we need to record these transactions differently. And so the whole revolution of blockchain implies that the way that we do transactions with each other with dollars would be somehow recorded differently than in the centralized system that we've had so far. So how does this centralized system work? Suppose that I pay you, Jonathan, $60, then both of our banks have a list with transactions on it, and my bank adds a transaction that says that I have $60 less And your bank has a list of transactions that says that you have $60 more. But other than those two banks, there is no record of this financial transaction taking place between the two of us. And so the idea of blockchain, which is a decentralized ledger, is that there are all these different copies out there 
of this list so that it can be verified through, say, a consensus mechanism that this transaction between the two of us has taken place. And so when we're talking about a digital currency, I think on the blockchain, I think this is what people have in mind. Yes, I think you're right, Jules. I think what they have in mind is a blockchain. So it's not just that the currency is digital, but that it's controlled by a blockchain. And there again, I'm like you, I don't really understand why we have a need for that. Because, you know, I would say part of the reason the United States is such a successful country is because we have trust. We have ledgers that we trust, and these organizations have been built up over time. And I don't see any reason why we need to doubt that system of trust. No, I completely agree. So, so when I ask my students, How many of you have looked at their checking account recently and have doubted what the amount was that was reported there? And does it bother you at all that your bank is the one who keeps track of this? And do you really wish that there were hundreds of different copies out there so that it could be verified through a consensus mechanism whether or not your amount on your account is correct, yes or no? And I don't think any of my students particularly in the US, as you mentioned, ever ever say that that is an issue for them. Although I think we can certainly think of other countries where that might be a concern, where record keeping of property rights might have a bigger application than it has in the United States. But that said, Jonathan, I do think you would agree that the United States payment system is quite antiquated, right? That is true. That is definitely true. And I don't necessarily why this is a solution to that problem, but it is true that it takes an enormously long time for me to pay you. And internationally, it's an, it's a nightmare. All right. So with all of these questions, because I don't think we've answered anything really, Jonathan, all we've done here is asked questions. But I think that a person who can help us answer these questions would be Kevin Warsh. So let me introduce our guest. Kevin Warsh is a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve from 2006 to 2011. He was also on the shortlist for Fed chair when ultimately Jerome Powell was appointed. He's a colleague of mine. He's the Shepard Family Distinguished Visiting Fellow in Economics at Stanford's Hoover Institution and a lecturer at the Graduate School of Business. Kevin, welcome to our show. Well, it's it's great to be, Jonathan, with you and Jules. So, Kevin, naively looking at this, Most dollars are already digital. So why bother with a new digital currency? Uh, This is a fertile subject, certainly made more fertile by the the ongoing geopolitical fights between and among adversaries and allies around the world. Yes, it's true. Stipulate to your fact, Jonathan, that commercial bank money is largely digital and commercial bank money, rather than central bank money, is dominant. But I think that that's really only the tip of the iceberg. My suggestion is that there be a central bank digital currency, but it'd be quite different from that, which is much discussed among government authorities. That is, it's confined to the wholesale market. There ought not be a retail-facing, consumer-facing central bank digital currency for reasons both of politics and economics. But in answer to your question, I think of the new technology as nothing but amazing new software that every 17-year-old computer scientist that shows up at Stanford will only be working with, will be the dominant use. And that new software lets us do things at the wholesale level, which are faster, cheaper, better, smarter, and will give the countries that adopt it a comparative advantage. And finally, if you have the benefit of having the world's reserve currency as your as your tailwind, you needn't be at the bleeding edge, but you also not you shouldn't be the last mover. And I take more seriously than some in our profession that the U.S. needs to constantly ensure that the dollar is the world's reserve currency remains so for the next hundred years. And I don't want to fall too far away from the efficient frontier. So, Kevin, it seems that, and I think you've also written about this extensively in various places, also in the Wall Street Journal, that one thing that you're particularly worried about is that the dollar would lose its reserve currency and particularly that it would lose it to the Chinese RMB. And given the fact that China has decided to already introduce a central bank digital currency 
that could be a worry that we should all be worried about. Now, you said that there is a competitive battle going on. You said it's it's very advanced software, but what do you think it would take for the US to lose its reserve currency status? And do you really think that just not having a central bank digital currency on its own is enough for the US to lose it? Or would other circumstances be required as well? It would probably be other circumstances too. But I worry that the dollar is losing just below the surface some of its credibility, some of its strength. And that has little to do with the new software. That has everything to do with, does the world look at the U.S. as the bright, shining city upon the hill that knows how to grow its economy, that knows how to ensure productivity? And I think the world does look at us differently, less enamored than they did the day before the 08 crisis, the day before the pandemic, even during the post-pandemic slog we've been through to this point. And so the most important thing for the dollar is to have good economic policies in place. And I think there's huge reforms that could be undertaken. Second most important thing is to treat our allies well, try to encourage them to be part of this sphere of influence dominated by the U.S. that has made the world, I apologize for this old fashioned view, a source of peace and prosperity for the globe so that the dollar is a global public good. But on the margin, these other things do matter. And I do think that going to market with the dollar with a payment system and a set of backbone technologies that are stuck in the 1970s, that are unreliable, that are slow, that are expensive, that have allowed oligopolists to benefit without letting those benefits accrue to the broad users of the system. That's an unnecessary asset to be stuck with. And so when I see this new technology, this blockchain technology being employed by both adversaries and allies in various forms, it says this is an easy way to put some points on the on the board and to lead the global economy, at least on this over the next for the 21st century. And just as a final point, whether we like it or not, Jules and Jonathan, the world is breaking into what appears to be at least two spheres of influence. Yes. Glibly, I'd call them ours and theirs. And in theirs, China wants to have their own payment system, wants to have their own currency for those that want to do business in their sphere of influence. And I think they would have preferred to have people join their sphere of influence out of choice. But if they won't join that sphere of influence out of choice, maybe they'll do it out of compulsion. If you want to source goods in that sphere, if you want to sell products to consumers in that sphere, they might well say that you need to separate yourself from the dollar and do it in this digital RMB. And I view that as a catalyst, hopefully, for our policymakers to at least move from 1970s technology and leapfrog to a new technology so that doing business in the dollar is true, not just in our sphere of influence when you're working directly with the U.S., but continues to be the dominant currency for the world. I think that accrues advantages to the U.S., but I also think it accrues advantages to everyone that would be participants in the dollar block around the world. I'm not sure. I agree with all your arguments. I'm not sure it has to do with the digital currency. I I agree our payment system is a 1970s payment system, but why do we need blockchain? Why can't we just bring the payment system into the 21st century? We could. And if you asked our colleagues that are working at the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, they would say they are making incremental progress in and around things like Fed now, making settlement faster, making the messaging system more apparent so you can track your transactions, etc. A policy of incrementalism is better than the status quo. But I think if you believe what I do, which is the US and global economy are going to look radically different 10 and 20 years from now, the world we grew up with, which is one of integrated global markets, integrated trade and capital flows, we might have seen, at least for quite a while, the high point of that. 
if there were ever a chance to move beyond incrementalism so that we could have payments, settlements, programmable money, and a new way of doing business and leapfrog, it strikes me this is the moment. But in some sense, if the other side is going to be using compulsion to try to do business in a particular currency and make it a reserve currency, the question is whether these soft measures are going to be enough to stop that in any case, wouldn't you say? So I don't think we'll be able to stop what they demand of customers in their block who want to do business with their customers. Yep. But I think what we can do, and here I'm going to paraphrase General McMaster, which I'll apply it to the monetary context, something he applies in the political and military context. What we're saying to people that have a choice of regimes, you can choose your own sovereignty versus subservience. We believe that if you participate in this new payment system and you continue to use the dollar in your transactions, whether the U.S. is directly involved or not, you can build on this system whatever APIs, whatever programmable money, whatever bells and whistles you want, and you can have control over your own payments. And I think that choice of freedom is a superior choice to these are the rules that you must go down. And again, that's why I would rather not make the choice between a modern, effective, compulsory system, which might be the future of the digital RMB, versus you choose that or you choose a unreliable, lazy, stubborn, expensive system, which has been the dollar block going on 40 or 50 years. I want the competition to be a better competition. So Kevin, I'm going to push back a little bit. And let me say this. My view is that one of the reasons the dollar is a world reserve currency is trust. That the United States has an incredibly high level of trust. And that's built up over a very long time, given this current system. And that I don't worry about China, the RMB ever being a reserve currency precisely because that trust doesn't exist. So why would you want to replace that with a system we're not certain about the trust? I mean, all the institutions in the United States have been built up to ensure that trust. How do we know under the new system we would have that trust? So if you're trying to pick a fight on trust, you're not going to find me choosing the other side of it. <laughs> so I, like you, believe that the American dollar-denominated post-war system is predicated on trust. I worry that some of that trust in institutions has eroded generally and has eroded in the U.S. particularly. So I don't seek to replace a system based on trust with something that is fashionable, untrustworthy, but cool. I want to replace that with a system which is more trustworthy. I want to build that transaction so it is more trustworthy, so it is fully auditable. Not so that it's in the underground, so that it's above ground. So that transaction happens seamlessly. If there's a bad actor, the audit trail is there for all of us to see. So in my view, the new system is enhancing of trust and reliability. And if the question is, well, no one has really built out yet an effective, scalable digital currency that is used by everyone around the world. That's absolutely true. But that's not a reason to stick with the old technology. Agreed. But I do think there's a deeper question here. And the deeper question is this. The main advantage, in my opinion, of blockchain is that it is a decentralized ledger instead of a centralized ledger. And so the question is, why do we need many copies of a decentralized piece of information rather than a centralized version of that piece of information? And I do think that the basic idea that people would have for that is that it's harder to commit fraud with a decentralized ledger than with a centralized ledger. If that isn't the main benefit, then I would like to know what would be the main benefit. And then we get back to what Jonathan pointed out earlier, which was if we just want to bring competition in line with an, an old-fashioned system up to speed with technology, is the decentralized feature really the feature that we should be going after? Or is it more something about how quickly transactions can be cleared and things like that, which of course can be done in many different ways? So I do think that the FTX fraud does make it clear that this system 
is just as much subject to fraud as any other system. And then what was the purpose of doing it this way to begin with then? Isn't that fair? Yeah, Jules, it is fair. So let's go into the three levels of that question as I distilled it. One is, is the FTX fraud about fraud in build out of a decentralized network? Or was the fraud done all centrally? I don't know the forensic accounting to that, yep. but I'd be very surprised given what I read in the newspaper. I have no privileged information that any of this was actually done on the blockchain, that any of this is in a perfect auditable trail. When this investigation from the SEC and the Justice Department and others are done, I think they're going to see the equivalent of wires written from one account to another, and it, it will it will have very little to do with the blockchain. But that's my speculation. That's my judgment. I don't think these guys had enough built out, it looks, uh, to suggest that this was done on some auditable chain. If so, the prosecutors will have the easiest job to do in the history of white collar crime. Yep. So that's a factual question. Um, I'm just asserting a premise based on what I've read. Secondly, on the payment system, I mean, this is the old joke, but it's true. It is now faster, easier, and more reliable for a Brazilian to put a million dollars in cash in a suitcase, board a plane from Rio, come to the United States, go through all the customs forms and deposit it at Bank of New York Mellon than it would have been to send that transaction through the existing payment system. It would have taken days longer, would have been more expensive to do it. So we're actually still bringing these atoms across borders. Yeah. There's huge benefits. The third question, I think, is a good and important both philosophical and structural question about centralized versus decentralized. So here's what I'm proposing in what I describe as a wholesale only central bank digital currency. It's decentralized in the sense that we're using the blockchain as the base foundation to conduct this business the trail is auditable. The money can only be sent once and only once. Any changes to the block would have to be seen inside of the block. It could happen instantaneously. And if some court had a warrant that it was being done for bad aims, you'd be able to see that distributed ledger perfectly. What's the piece of this that in my intellectual model is centralized? The Fed and the Treasury say, this is the proffered framework. These are the rails we'll be using, and we will all be using these same rails. If you want yeah. this to be backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. and the dollar's reserve currency, you can't build your own bespoke system. We don't want there to be dozens and hundreds of these working in parallel. I was plenty worried about that direction. So, Kevin, one of the things that you've written about is that you favor stable coins and, and you favor regulation of stable coins. But I wouldn't say bank regulation is one of our prides and joys. I, I would say that, if anything, we're pretty bad at regulating banks. So why would you want us to regulate yet another financial instrument? I disagree with the words you just purported to put in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I am incredibly uncomfortable with the idea, which has been gaining traction in Washington, that stable coins are fine so long as they're, we regulate them like a bank. I think this is a dangerous and bad idea. I want to be very clear on that. So I think broadly the idea of taking the stable coins that are out and about, subjecting them to bank regulation is a bad idea. Why? Because bank regulation is imperfect. And two, when you're regulating something that purports to be the U.S. dollar and it fails, in my view, the political economy makes it such that you almost assuredly have to bail it out because you don't want the dollar to be falling in its prestige and its privilege. You don't want there to be people that say, I wonder if that dollar is really worth it after all. So I am uncomfortable with the idea of a regulatory framework as the panacea for stable coins. And in that, at least in the pre-FTX days, my voice seemed to be in the minority. Large number of thoughtful legislators from both parties seemed positively inclined to that idea. And I will say it worried me and continues to worry me tremendously. 
Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, it was great, Kevin. So, Jonathan, I think that was a pretty interesting conversation. I learned a lot of new things there. You know, Jules, I was pretty convinced by his argument that the government has a role in setting up the rails. So if they set up a uh, digital currency, which is just rails, and allow private enterprise to do whatever they want with it, that sounds like a pretty good thing for government to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Jonathan. Government providing infrastructure while giving the private sector all the room it wants to be entrepreneurial, I think that's exactly what one would want. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcast. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcast. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.